James Jesus. See, he thought that Jesus' name was Hispanic. Some of us think that Jesus is American. Some of us think that Jesus is just like us when he's completely different. He was a Jew. And when we come to understand who Jesus is, I hope and in this study, you'll be able to see this in a different light. We're able to study the entire book of John. That means that we go through every chapter. Do you know why I don't skip from chapter to chapter or from book to book? It's because I want you to understand books in their entirety. How many have seen movies and you walked in halfway into the movie and you're lost? Eh? Right? How many have done that? You catch a movie halfway and you don't even know what, what's going on. Same way with the Word of God. We're going to learn the Word of God. We're going to start in John chapter 3, verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there Jesus was spending time with them. And what was he doing? You're following me, right? You read it again. After these things, Jesus and his disciples, who went? Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea in Galilee. And there he was spending time. Who was spending time with the disciples? Now think about that for a second. God is spending time with his people. That's what Jesus is. Jesus is God, and he's spending time with people. If there's anybody that wants to spend time with you, it's God. Let me put it this way. If there's anybody that can stand you, it's God. Amen. Give me an amen. amen. That's a joke, okay? Why are you guys so serious? Here's the thing. Jesus spent time with the disciples, and what was he doing with them? He was teaching them things. Baptizing. So they had a mission to go out and baptize. How many of you have been baptized at least once in your life? Raise your hand. Do you remember when, Frida, when, you were, when were you baptized? Were you baptized once or twice? twice? Why? Because the first time the water got real muddy, what, what happened? <laughs> they put you back in. You didn't stay down long enough for Benny? So, how, so you got baptized as a child? As a child, did you want to be baptized as a child? You don't remember? Okay. How many of you got baptized as a child? Why did you get baptized as a child? Huh? Who? Your parents did? What did it benefit you? What did, how old were you, Dan? Six or seven months? What did it benefit you from six to seven months? What, what was your thought when you went under the water? At six or seven months, who remembers their six and seven months, uh, your, what you were thinking? What were you thinking at six and seven months? <laughs> Clueless. All you wanted was the bottle. Amen? Amen? So why were we baptized at an early age in some religions? I'll tell you why you were baptized. Because mom and dad had a responsibility to their church to baptize you at an early age. A lot of people came from that at some point in time. I know at my, at my, my part, my mom baptized me. So in case I died as a child, I could be allowed into heaven. Is that how it works? How many, who said yeah? Somebody said yeah. Yep. Is that how it works? When you're a baby... And you die, they baptize you so you can get to heaven. Does water baptism take away your sins? So how can you enter heaven if you have sin? And what we've done, and the whole point of this, and we're going to find out that the precepts of men and the teachings of men are wrong. And God's teaching, he comes back to get us to understand exactly what this thing about baptizing is all about. So he's bringing us to a point where he's teaching us the need of baptism. Do we need to be baptized? Yes or no? Yes. Now, when you're baptized as a child, how many were baptized as a child? 
It was your it was your mom's and dad's responsibility to teach you the Bible so you would understand why you got baptized. Well, let me tell you something. By that time, when they got you to a certain age to start teaching you, how many of you remember that teaching? In other words, a lot of us weren't taught after we were baptized as kids. Would you agree? We weren't taught anything. So what benefit did baptism have? None. Absolutely none. It was just a ritual. It was just a custom. It was something that we did because that's what my mom and dad did. So when I grew up as a, as a teenager, was 18, I, I, could, I was allowed to, to be drafted. I could vote. Then I asked my mom, what party do I go to? What political party? And my mom and dad were Democrats. So that's what I was. Okay. Did I understand anything about the Democratic Party? No. Did I understand anything about the Republican Party? No. Did I understand anything about government at all from school books? No. This is what I learned in school. Lunch and playing football. That's what I learned. I learned nothing about our government. So here I became a Democrat by the choice of my parents. I got baptized by the choice of my parents. And yet I had no understanding of any of those things. And here's Jesus spending time with them. And baptizing. Jesus, you'll find out later on, I think chapter 4, you'll find out that Jesus himself didn't baptize with water. He taught his disciples to baptize with water. So that's why he's spending time. We want to talk a little bit about baptism. Baptism does not send you to heaven. Because if it did, how much water would you need? How much water would you need to take away your sins? Not even the ocean has enough water. Not even the universe, if it was full of water, does not have enough water to take away your sins. There's only one way for your sins to be taken away, and it's not water. If it is, tell me how much gallons you would have to use to take away the sin of lying. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have lied, Phoebe? See, Phoebe's perfect. She goes, she's an Aggie. She goes to Las Cruces. She's going to become uh, a vet. Is that what you're going to become? Or have you changed already? By the time you're done, you're going to be a hairdresser. Watch. So, you're, you're, you're like my first granddaughter. When we met you and, and Brian, well, your mom and Brian, you came along later. You were like my first granddaughter because you, you, your parents were that close to us. You felt like my first granddaughter. Your mom thinks you're perfect. She's not. We're going to pick on Phoebe. Phoebe, have you lied to your mom? <laughs> her mom's looking at her. That was a good lie because you didn't even know. You just found out now she lied to you. How many of you have lied? How much water do you need to take that lie away? How much water is necessary to wash away in your spirit that lie? How much water do you need? Hmm. So baptism must be about something else that we haven't been taught. You come to this church. I just don't take notes. I study. I get into it. I've never been like that before. It's not enough to, you know what, I got next week's sermon. I'm going to write down some notes. That's not enough. Expect more from the ministers that come up here to teach. You expect them to study. So we can all find out what Jesus Christ is talking about. Just to cover a verse and just to use scripture is not good enough. Find out the context of what Jesus Christ is talking about here. Verse 23. What's it say? Verse 23. I threw them up. Catch, just keep on with me. John chapter 3, verse 23. See, there's some things that has to happen in the back that there's some workers in the back. They have to keep up with me on the camera. 
there's usually guys that stand here and it's really easy to keep the camera on and then they have to go to a different thing and then they have to click on it and they have to take all this stuff. They're working hard back there. So we have to catch up. John 3, 23. John. John who? John the Apostle or John the Baptist? The Baptist. John the Apostle or the disciple at this time is talking about John the Baptist. John was bapti baptizing and Anon near Salim because there was much water there and people were coming to John and were being baptized. It's kind of interesting. The word Anon, that word there, is the word springs. And it's used in the scripture and it's described, this is a place in Samaria which bordered Israel. The Samaritan people were not Jewish. They were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half-Gentile. They had a different religion in Samaria. They started out with God and they, they kind of in, evolved into being a pagan religion. They had kind of God in one pocket and other gods in another pocket. And the issue here is John's baptizing in that area because he's reaching out because there was plenty of water there. Lots of springs in the Samaritan region of, of a, uh, Aon, Nainon. Because there was much water there, people were coming and were being baptized. Why were they coming? John had a direct, direct access to people to tell them, turn from your sins and come and be baptized. Now, he told them to turn from their sins. You as a Christian must turn from your sins, then be baptized. What's baptism about? It's symbolic. It's symbolic that we use water to take a bath. Who used pickle juice this morning to bathe, to bathe themselves? Who used pickle juice? Look at your neighbor real quick. If they had that sour puss on their face like, like that, they use pickle juice. Look at your neighbor real quick. How many know that using water is to cleanse us of dirt, right? We, we work during the day, we start to sweat, we get dirty doing our business there, building whatever we're building, and then we jump into the shower, we cool down because it's been hot during the day, we're dirty, and it washes off dirt. Let me tell you something about the water that we see here when they're being baptized. It's telling me and you, we're dirty. Every one of us are dirty. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us needs a Savior. Every one of us needs to come to Christ because we have a dirty spirit life. That water cannot take that sin away. Only Christ can. And when you don't recognize that you're a sinful person, you'll never go to Christ. You'll never receive Him. You'll never be uh, freed from your sins. You'll die in your sins if you don't believe that Jesus Christ died for you. But what we've done is we started to devolve in the church. We started using kind of methods that no longer mean anything. It don't, it doesn't, baptism doesn't mean anything to the church anymore. And here's Christ telling them this is what baptism's about. Jesus spends time with him. John the Baptist, that's his mission. He was there to baptize people, telling people, you need to repent from your sins. Now, you may not like that. You may not like being called dirty. But that's what you are. That's what I am. I'm dirty. And there was a point in my life where I had to come to a Savior who could clean me up. You cannot clean yourself up. If you could, then Jesus didn't have to die on a cross for you. If water could clean you up, if doing a good deed to poor people, or to a community, if that makes you better, how much work must you put in to take away your sins? See, I'm going to bring you back to what Jesus is doing in our lives. Jesus is telling us we need to be washed with water because we're all dirty. We're all sinners. This guy right here, I'm the biggest sinner in this whole room. I know what I've done as a pastor that I shouldn't have done as a pastor. I understand that I need a Savior. I understood that I was going to hell. And you know what? If you don't think you're going to hell, you're not going to hell only because Christ took away your sins. And if you die in your sins, you're not going to go to heaven. And it's not even about heaven. It's about being with God forever. Your sins make you dirty. My sins make me dirty. Water, Tide. See kids eating Tide Pods? 
What's with that? What are they trying to cleanse? They're not, they're not trying to cleanse anything. They just don't have a brain eating a Tide Pod. And here we are trying to clean our lives. I'm going to put it to this point. We try to perform for God to be accepted by Him. So I'm going to be baptized. Not only am I accepted by God, now I'm accepted by this church people. Do we baptize? Yeah, we were going to have baptisms during Easter. We have a unit already that actually will give us hot water. You don't have to be dipped in ice water anymore in this church. We built a unit. It's, it's uh, direct demand water. It'll make it hot. We're going to baptize some people. We got it all ready. We got a plug in the back for 210 volts or whatever it's called. Got it all ready. Then this virus hits and then we don't baptize anybody. Why do you get baptized? Well, here's why I got baptized. Because I was going to turn from my sins. Because I understood I have to turn from them. Then be baptized in front of all of you to let you know that Christ has cleansed me. Not the water. And that I die and I go underneath the water like a tomb. Then I come back out of the water because Christ made me alive from that tomb, from that watery grave. I come out into a new life. If your life hasn't changed after baptism, it's probably because you didn't repent. Your life should change. You should be cleaned up by God's blood, by the Son's blood. You should be clean, and your life begins to become transformed. Water baptism means nothing without Christ. Nothing. Christ means everything. And if Christ was baptized, because we know John the Baptist baptized Christ, Christ had no sin. But why did he get baptized if Jesus had no sin? Jesus got baptized as an example for you and I to follow. Jesus said, this is the right thing to do. So do it now, John. Permit this to be, to be done. So he gets baptized. Go back to James. See the girls? That's where I should have gone on the, after this 22nd verse. Jesus is spending time with them. Water, as it's used in the New Testament and Old Testament, is baptized, is the very fact that the baptisms were used in the New Testament, were they in the Old Testament? Or ba are baptisms only found in the New Testament? Who can answer that? Said what? Someone mumbled something I couldn't hear because I'm deaf. Was there baptisms in the Old Testament? Yes or no? No, yes, no, yes. Was there baptism in the Old Testament? Or is baptism a New Testament term alone? Was it in the Old Testament? What were they called? Purification. Washings is what is called in the Old Testament. You went into the Old Testament temple, you had to wash before you went into the temple. Some of you got your temperature checked. Some of you don't like that. That's right, you're doing it for me. It's for me, okay? Why is it for me? Because I want to obey some things for the sake of me. Okay? We look at baptisms. When you look at a baptism, you have to understand this is what Jesus requires. So baptism has to be done correctly. Old Testament, they were called purifications and washings. They had lavers. A laver looks like a big old disco. And it had water in it. And it was symbolic of cleansing. How many know that we need water to live? Okay, it's symbolic of the life-giving symbolism that it gives. We must have water to live. Cleansing, the priests had to be cleansed before they ministered to the people in the temple. They had to sacrifice goats and rams and bulls. They had to kill turtle doves as sacrifices and they literally killed them, cut their throats and spilled blood all over the altar. Those are pictures and types of what Christ is to us. And here's what we have to understand is that you need to be cleansed because you're dirty. 
No one likes to be told that. No one likes to be called a sinner. No one likes to be called that. Well, you think you're better. No, this is me saying sinner from the heart of a sinner. James chapter 4 verse 7 very clearly tells us James the apostle was the stepbrother of Jesus Christ. He was the stepbrother. He was a pastor in a church in Jerusalem. James was killed by the leadership of the day, the Jews. They cast him off a high wall. He hit the ground, didn't die. Then they came around him and they got what was called fuller soap paddles, which looks like a big old paddle, like an oar. And they beat him to death because they hated what he preached. He died a martyr. James, right here, grew up with Jesus Christ. I mean, all of us have that sister or that brother that are smarter than us, huh? Right? We have all have that? How would you like to grow up with Jesus being your brother? I mean, what kind of pressure is that? James grows up and Jesus is the God of the universe, the Savior. And James writes this, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8 says this, verse 8 says, Draw near to God. What's James telling us? You first. You first. You draw near to God. Then he says this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You first need to come to God in order for him to come to you. Notice this. Cleanse your hands. Let me use another word. Wash your hands. Why do we wash our hands? Because they're dirty. With what? Look right there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Ah, oh, quit calling me a sinner. Have we sinned? If anyone has broken one of the Ten Commandments, the Bible says you broke them all. Has anyone ever lied? And let's just say it this way to give you a break. A white lie. Half truth, half lie. Who's ever lied? Raise your hand. Sinner. Those that were like this, you just lied. You didn't raise your hand. We know you've lied. We can call your mom up and we can find out. She says, yeah, he's a little lying dog. <laughs> How many of you have ever stolen anything? Taken something that does not belong to you? Sinner. How many of you? I'm pretty sure everybody in here has a mom and dad. Or you were ordered from Home Depot. I think everybody was born from mom and dad. We all had a mom and dad. How many of you disobeyed your mom and dad? Raise your hand. Sinner. See, I'm not putting you down. We've all done that. We have all sinned. Have we not? One sin separates you forever from God. Forever. To the point where God's going to punish you for your sin. Not that God wants to hurt you, but God wants to save you because he knows you're separated from him. He did something about that. He sent his son to die in your place because of your sin. He took your sin in his body on the cross that we might be made right by God. So Jesus walked the right walk, talked the right talk when we didn't. And when we accept Jesus Christ, he takes away our sin and he takes away our death. And Jesus exchanges his life and he says, now I walk the right walk. I know it's hard for you to walk the right walk, Pastor Danny. I know it's hard for you to be right with me. But you know what? Walk like Jesus walks. I'll give you his life and you can walk in him and him in you. God gave us Jesus' life to walk in. So when you go to heaven, you're in Christ. God doesn't see you 
in your sin. He sees Christ, his son, who gave his life for you. It's a great exchange. Jesus doesn't want anyone going to hell. But you know what? People will go to hell. Jesus said so. Does he want them to go? No. Jesus died for everyone. But not everyone wants Jesus. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. It tells me that this guy has to have a constant cleansing. My hands aren't always clean. I've got to come back constantly and cleanse my hands. How do I do that? God, I confess my sins. You're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all wrongdoing, unrighteousness, and sin. Because sin makes us dirty. There's a constant cleansing of your hands. You cleanse your hands all the time. And it's amazing how now we have hands sanitizers and we were ordered to wash our hands what have we been doing before then what have we been doing with our hands prior to that do we know how filthy our hands are you only know that and we now start washing our, our hands and making sure that our hands are clean so we don't pass anything especially cooties cooties are the worst things in life but he says purify your hands cleanse your hands wash your hands and he calls us sinners and purify your hearts. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded people have two souls. That's what the word double-minded means. How do you purify your heart? You can't. Your heart is wicked. Your heart is awful. It affects your entire being. You can sit in church right there. Sit in church. Be absolutely quiet. Go into your thoughts, and while you're at church before God, have an awful thought. Guys, we can be sitting here minding our own business, and a beautiful girl walks into the room. Some of them I say, that means nothing. Or some of them I say, hubba bubba. <laughs> Does anybody know what hubba bubba means? Or say, the machine. Or like in Spanish, a la máquina. That woman, hey, mind, mind. Over here, over here. You can be sitting, and the awful thought shows you what kind of person you are. I'm not picking just on men. Here's the issue. Purify your hearts. You can't do it. You can't get water and purify it. You can't make it right. You can't make it clean. You can't do any of that. God does that. The cleansing comes from God. The cleansing comes from His Son, Jesus Christ. When you understand that, you understand that purification and washings of the Old Testament are symbolic of the need for forgiveness. I need to be forgiven. I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. Last week, did I sin? You betcha. Did I mean to? No, it's just things that you get kind of lazy. Or you start to entertain a thought. Or you start to do something. Or you say something stupid to your wife. Amen. See, he did. <laughs> right? We say, and you know what? We sin in one fashion or another in our, even our walk. Even as Christians, everybody expects us to be perfect. We're not. We're always struggling with our flesh, our own nature. And it tries to tell us to do stuff that we don't want to do. And the things that I want to do, I don't want to do. That's the same thing the Apostle Paul said, Book of Romans. When you understand that our hands need to be cleansed constantly, you have to come up to God and every time, God, you know what? I neglected praying to you today. And when you neglect praying, you're just saying you're not important enough to talk to today. And what if I went up to you and said, you know what, hi, how are you doing? But you know what, I ain't, I ain't got time to spend with you, so I'll just check you out later. How would you be hurt? Sure. We don't spend time reading the Word of God. That's the only way you're going to know about Christ is reading the Word of God. Do we pick up the Bible? Half of us don't pick up the Bible. Why? Because we don't want to know about Him. We want to go to these dating sites to know about her. I think she's the right one. We're so naive. 
Even as young men and teenagers, we were at a Bible camp, one of the guys that was a single guy, was sitting there at the table after we went to a conference, a men's conference, and we're sitting there eating breakfast at a motel, and the guy kept on saying, that girl's looking at me. She's checking me out. That girl's looking at me. We kind of looked at him and thought, no, he's not, she's not looking at you, dude. Yeah, she is. Look at her. Her, her eyes are on me. And we tell him, dude, she's cross-eyed. She doesn't even know you're there. She's not really looking at you. Completely thought that he was, you know, she was loving on him. Where do our minds go sometimes? Sometimes they just take off. When you read the Word of God, you find out who Christ is. You can't find out how He is any other way. You can't find out how Christ is through prayer. You find out how He is in the Bible. You find out you have a relationship here online with your Bible. You get in a relationship with Christ when you read your Bible. You don't read your Bible, you don't teach here. You don't read your Bible here, you don't teach here. You don't, you're not a minister here. If you don't read your Bible, there, there's something else you can do. But we're not going to put you in charge of people when you don't know what the Bible says. You better know the Bible. I have to know. You have to know. We have to know the right thing. So understand, we're dirty. He's calling us dirty. Cleanse our hands. He's telling us to make sure that we turn from our sins. Because sin can actually think in your, you can, in your mind. You can think that sin is fun. Look at the next verse. Verse 9. We, and it, it does bring, sin does bring pleasure. But God has a type of pleasure that's greater than sin pleasure. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Why would he tell us? He's talking to sinners because we are miserable thinking we're happy. We're mourning thinking that we're rejoicing. And we're, re we're laughing rather than thinking that we're weeping. Because that's what sin does. Sin makes you miserable. It makes you mourn. And it causes you to weep. Let your laughter turn, be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Why? Because you love sin so much. Let's turn around and cry over our sin is what he's saying here on verse 9. Look at verse 10. When you do this, when you turn from sin, this is what you're actually doing. You're humbling yourself. You're putting yourself under God's hand. You're saying, God, I want to do it your way, not my way. When you understand that humility is a place of power, when you understand that submission, putting yourself under Christ, is the place to be, it gives you power to live a life that Christ expects you to live. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Understand that. When you're sinning, you're not exalted. You're called what's called abased. You're put on the bottom. Sin destroys. Understand that. Understand we're earthy. Understand that we're sinners. Understand that we got to turn from those things. And God wants us walking like Christ in righteousness and in innocence, not harming anyone. You know you have a bad religion when you're able in your religion to curse someone with some kind of spell. You know that in the Bible you can't pray against anyone. But when you have a religion that preaches that you can actually curse someone with your prayers, that religion is not of God. That is a religion of hate. If you're taught in your religion to hate people for their skin color or their gender or for whatever, that's a religion of hate. Now Christ doesn't give us any opportunity to sin. So we must turn from those things and when we do, God exalts you. Here's what baptism does. It confronts you with your personal sin. You and I have personal sin. That's the thing that's going to kill us and separate us from God. That's why Jesus came to die for your sins. No one here, no one here is perfect. We've all sinned. But we got to turn from our sins. Just not believe that God forgives us because that's not enough. You just can't say, well, God, I know that you forgive my sins. So I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Wrong. You're going to live in misery. You're going to live in hurt. Trust me, I've been down that road as a Christian. 
trying to do my own thing. And you know what happened? Every, every time I went to go sin as a Christian, as a pastor, I went down a road that was a dead end. I had to come back out and find another road. And when I ventured out into another area of sin, I went down a dead end road to the point where God says, I've had enough with you. And then he kind of humbled me. Let me show you how he humbled me. He slammed my face into the dirt. Everything that I had done in my practice caused me to fall flat on my face. It crushed me. It hurt me. And God says, that's your way. Get up and I'll show you my way. That's what humility is. That's what being humble is. See, everybody you meet have a destination. They're either heaven or hell. We want everybody to go to heaven. Amen? Why do we have church here? Why do we gather people here? Slowly but surely, everybody's trickling back. Slowly but surely, everybody's trickling back. Coming back to church. Is it to make me look good that we've got people in our church? Is it to make this church look good that we have people in the church? Or is it to save the souls that are lost? Is it to kind of sit together and learn the word of God so we can reach someone else for the kingdom of God? Is it about gathering our own personal disciples or saving souls? Let me tell you, it's the latter. We're here to save souls. And sometimes you have to confront a sinner in his sin. Why? Because you love him. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to push my religion down anybody's throat. I had a Christian woman tell me that. I'm not going to push I'm not going to talk to them about Jesus. I'm not going to push my religion down their throat. You know what Jesus said? Go and preach the gospel. Having them be teach them the gospel, tell, tell them to observe all that they do, having them baptized in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, go and change the world is what he said. And here we're saying, well, I'm not going to do that, Jesus. I'm not going to push my religion down somebody's throat. There's a word in the Bible called compel. Go into the highways, go into the byways and compel them to come in. Do you know what the word compel them comes to come in means? Here's what Jesus says. Go into the streets of grants. When you see a sinner, and you can tell who they are because they cuss God right in front of your face. They're on drugs. They're lost. You can tell. You confront them. The word compel means this. With force, draw them to the kingdom. And here's people saying, well, I don't want to preach something that somebody's going to get offended. Jesus said, compel them to come in. Force them to come in. How can you force anybody but to preach a strong gospel that God was sent, sent his son to die for them? Because if they don't accept Christ, compel them to come to Christ. Because if they don't, they're going to be lost. There's more to this life than 75 years. After that, we die. Where do you go? See, when I see an obituary, See their age, see where they live, see who their family were, see the, where the service. I look at that and I think, are they saved? I could care less what time the reception is. I could care less when they're going to bury him. I'm concerned, was he saved? And who talked to him about Christ? That's our job. By humbling ourselves, we do what Jesus says to do. And when you do it, he raises you up. Remember John 3? We read that verse, I think, 14. John chapter 3. We read this weeks ago. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's a story in the Old Testament. The children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. You know what they did? They complained. 
They complained about everything. They complained to Moses, their pastor, their shepherd, their leader. They complained and they grumbled about everything. Well, what did you, why did God bring us out here just to kill us? We should have stayed in Egypt. We had leeks and we had fish and we had meat. We ate good in Egypt, but you were slaves in Egypt. That's why God set them free. So what did the children of Israel do? They complained and they murmured and they, they quarreled and they went off to do their own thing. When they did their own thing, when you do your own thing, something will happen to you. I got slammed. Face right in the dirt. Pain came into my life. I was distraught for I harbored sin in my heart and my flesh began to waste away. Until I turned from my sin and sought refreshing from God. Sought and said, God, I have sinned against you and you alone. Forgive me of my sins. When I finally surrendered it all to Christ and I turned to him, he began to heal me. This picture right here, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you know what that's about? The children of Israel were complaining and complaining and complaining. And God said, I've had enough. I'm done. You know what God did? He turned the snakes of the wilderness on, permitted them to go bite the children of Israel who were sinning. You read that Old Testament scripture in the book of Exodus. They were complaining. God says, okay, you want to complain? I'm tired of it. You complained about Moses. I'm tired of it. I'm done. Snakes came up and bit everyone that was disobedient with the children of Israel. What did they have to do? Moses, the leader, said, God, they're dumb. He said that's about the million of people that were led out of Egypt. He says, they're dumb, God. Take care of them, please. Let me seek you. He was like an intercessor. He started saying, God, don't bring this upon them. Do something to help them. And God relented. In other words, God changed his mind because the leader said, God, they're getting bit and dying. Moses represents Jesus Christ. It doesn't represent your pastor. It doesn't represent your priest. It doesn't represent any human being. It represents Jesus Christ. Moses represents Jesus Christ. Christ represents Moses in this respect. And they were bit by these snakes. You will be bit by your sin. There are sin snakes in your life. And they'll bite you. And they'll hurt you. And the only one that can remedy that poison in your life. Who has the antidote? The antidote for that sin in your life. That poison that's in you. Caused by sin is Jesus Christ. So even the Son of Man must be lifted up. How was he lifted up? Here's what Moses did. Years before Jesus came, he created a staff. And on that staff, was, it was made out of bronze. And on that staff was the picture of a snake going up. You may see that snake. It's used sometimes in medical fields where you see the snake on a staff and it's wrapped around there. And they looked up at that staff. He says, if you want to live, turn from your sins. Go to that post made of bronze and go look at that post. And immediately... People that were bit because of their sin went to the post, which represents the cross. They looked at the snake wrapped up on the cross, and they were healed because they repented and then went to Christ. The snake represents Christ. Get this part. How does an awful snake who was biting the children of Israel represent Christ? That doesn't seem right. Doesn't the snake, is it a serpent? Wasn't the serpent in the, in, in the Garden of Eden? Wasn't the serpent the one that lied to Adam and Eve? Wasn't it him who poisoned their minds? So how could Christ be the serpent? There's a scripture in the New Testament that Jesus became sin for me. So he took my sin 
for me. And he gave me his life. Jesus had to become sin. Serpent represents sin. Jesus died for your sin. He took it. Let me tell you something. Your sin, my sin, your children's sin killed Christ. You're guilty of killing the Son of God by you lying to your mother, by you stealing something. You broke one of the Ten Commandments. The only way to get rid of the sin is to look at sin who became, to look at Christ who became sin for me. And I can live. Everyone that walked up to that bronze serpent on a staff, the snake was molded up on the top. They looked at that and they were healed. When you come to Christ, you look at Christ, he takes away your sin. Because he became sin for you. The life that you lived as a sinner, you get it and you trade it in. The life that Jesus lived as the right living son of God, he trades his right life for your wrong life. He gives you an exchange. Here, I lived the right life, Jesus says. I want you to use it. And you put it on. You didn't live it, but you're a company now to live it correctly because of the power of the Holy Spirit. When you understand that these verses are telling about, talking to us about sin, we have to be rid of our sin. How is that? Let, let me add this. If you're a Christian, you hate sinning. When you're a Christian, you do not, inside of you, you despise sinning against God. If you're a true Christian, if you're not, sinning is okay with you. It's a pleasure. That's, that's, that's going to tell you a lot about your life. It's going to tell you where you're headed. When you don't care, if God considers a sin, I could care less. That tells you where your destination is. Because the saved life is a changed life. It's a changed life. God changes you. Go back to John chapter 23. John's baptism, Jesus is doing baptizing, the ministries overlap. John's going out there baptizing people. That wasn't his only job. You know what John's number one job was? Does anybody know what John's number one job was? Here's John. He's Jesus' cousin. <laughs> what makes me crazy is people that call everybody their mom and dad. What drives me crazy is everybody's their cousin, brother, sister, mom. It just drives me crazy. It confuses the kids. It does. I have only one mom. And I honor her by calling her mom. I don't go up to Shani and call her mom. She looks nothing like me. <laughs> nothing. I only have one mom. I only have one dad. And here's John. He had one job. And we sometimes think it's baptizing. John was baptizing also. John had a purpose. You have a purpose. John was picked by God to do something specific. And what was that? Turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. See, I've got a purpose in my life. Never knew. I never knew what it was. Then one day God says, I'm going to save your soul. Really? He saved me. I didn't save me. God saved me. I didn't know that I would be talking in front of people up here. This was not my career decision. I did not think I would ever be a pastor. If any of my friends found out, they also would say, yeah, we never thought he would. They knew my life. I never planned this, but God had a purpose like he did with John. And God spoke to John even before he was born. So here we are sitting in a church wondering, huh, 
I just can't wait till this is over because before, if we have to get to the, the restaurant before Monday because they're going to close all, all the restaurants up. That's all we're concerned about sometimes is just what restaurant we're going to go eat. And how long is this Mexican going to stay up here preaching and talking? Man, the Baptists are going to beat us to Denny's because there's not any more open restaurants in Grants. Here's John's purpose. Our purpose is important. God has a purpose for you. And it's between you and God to figure out what that is. I can't tell you what it is. I can see some outlying factors that I see in your life and say, you know what, that guy really likes helping people. Well, you're going to be, you're going to always have a servant's heart. God's going to use you to become great. Because every servant that God uses become great in the kingdom of God. I don't know what your purpose is, but here's John's purpose. Behold, I am going to send my messenger. Who is he talking about? In Malachi chapter 3. John. This is a prophecy or a prediction so you can understand. The prediction that John is being picked by God. God says, behold, I'm going to send my messenger. This is God speaking. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 1. When you understand when was Malachi written... Does anybody know when the time that we're hearing about Jesus talking to his disciples, how many years had lapsed since this prophecy was spoken by God about the, the baptizer called John? How many years was it before John ever came into the scene being born? Someone tell me. How many years was it? 400? 400. Predicted 400 years before it happened in Malachi. There, it shows us that he's predicted to come in before he was even born. John was picked for this. John knew it. Jesus knew it. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. Who's the Lord that you're going to seek that will suddenly come into the temple? Who is that? That is Jesus. God sends John, he's a messenger, he sends him to prepare the way, and suddenly Jesus shows up. You look at the book of John, Jesus shows up, John baptized him. There's this prophecy being fulfilled 100%. And the messenger of the covenant, Jesus is the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This John was predicted in coming, and John came and did his ministry. Not only that, let me show you some crazy stuff. I'm going to bypass the rest of those verses because it's so long. Isaiah 40, another prophecy. How many years is Isaiah 40 compared to Malachi? Malachi was 400 years. After Malachi ended, the book of Malachi, there was 400 years of silence from God. There was, God did not speak to the people for 400 years. Malachi was the last messenger. And then it was silent. God didn't speak to anybody. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. How many years is this prophecy about the, about the baptizer John? How many years is this prophecy? Get to your footnotes. Get to the front where it says context. Information, 700 years. So John's being talked about 400 years. Isaiah, 700 years. John's not even around. 700 years before John came. Look at the accuracy of these scriptures, how they confirm one another. A voice is calling. Whose voice is that? Who's? A voice is calling. Clear the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Whose voice is that? John the Baptist. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Look what he says in the next verse. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. What's he saying? John is going to be sent to tell people, get ready, the Savior's coming. Turn from your sins and be baptized. When we understand that, John the Baptist was called before he was born. 
I wonder, I, I look at faces here like Enrique, I look at Jesse and Walter, I look at Leandro, I look at Benny, Dennis. I wonder, hmm, I've got, I wonder if God's called them. God's called you to do something. I just don't know what it is. You, you and God need to get together, Robbie, to see what God's called you to do, bro. You, everybody's always thinking, well, I don't want to do anything. Neither did I. Look where I'm at today. Having to be up here to tell you things. I never picked this life. It picked me. God picks you. And I don't have a clue. I think you all have a purpose in God's plan. And only you and God can develop that. The same way John, his job was to just not baptize, pronounce the message. Here's two verses, and there's something the same about both verses. If you go to John chapter 1, verse 23, look at this. Isaiah, 700 years. Malachi, 400 years. We go to John chapter 1. And Jesus says this, talking about John. The Holy Spirit says this, talking about John. Even John knows, John chapter 1, verse 23. I am a voice, John the Baptist said. God called me 700 years, 400 years. I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Make your life right. Make it straight. You've been walking all crooked in life. Make it straight. Go to the Lord. Quit going down that alley that's a dead end. Quit going down that alley that's dead end. You know what? You can seek whatever you want to seek, but you know what? You keep the way straight when you go to God. You might have all kinds of careers. That's between you and God. As you seek God, it'll be straight to Him, not to a church, not to a pastor, not to a career, not to anything. Straight to Him. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet wrote. Notice. His purpose is God's purpose. Back in John chapter 3, verse 24, it says this. John had yet not been thrown into prison. Everybody knows John was thrown into prison, right? Why was he thrown into prison? Because he wasn't wearing a mask. <laughs> because he wasn't wearing seat belts. Why was John thrown in prison? Because of evil men. Because of evil men, he was thrown into prison. They were jealous of John. That decision came from seduction from a young lady who seduced the king and told him in a drunken rage. Whatever, he was so turned on by this dancing chick that he says, whatever you ask for, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. And then the... The, she went up to her mom. He's going to give me half of the kingdom. What do you want me to get? Go read that story. And the mom says, ask him for the head of John the Baptist. And guess what, she, guess what they brought? He was in prison. Guess what they brought? They brought his head on a platter. For what? Making the way straight. You're always going to have haters when you tell people about Christ. Why? Because you're going to confront them about their sin. No one wants to be confronted about you. That's what I'm called to do. Either I answer to you or I answer to God. Let me tell you something. I'd rather answer to God. John the Baptist, not yet. He hadn't been thrown into prison yet. It's just the commentary here. Look at verse 25. There arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples. Whose disciples? 
with a Jew, probably a religious leader, about purification. Here's the thing. The Jew was a legalist. He obeyed the law to the T. He understood that there was purification rites, there was washings. There has to be washings. Jesus was confronted by these people one time when Jesus and his disciples were walking down the road. And as they were walking down the road, the disciples grabbed some grain that was left on the side of a field, which they could do legally. God prescribed that you leave grain on the outer borders of your crops. So in case a poor person came by, they could eat it. And that was God's way of saying, share your crop with poor people. Give to the poor people. Leave that grain on the outside for anybody that's walking down the path. They can grab some grain and eat and they can be satisfied. You're helping poor people. And Jesus and his disciples were walking down the path and they grabbed some grain and started to eat it. And then all of a sudden this religious Jew or Jews, the religious people who try to put rules on you, comes up to him and says, Why do your disciples eat with unclean hands? Why do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to wash your hands before you eat. And why do your disciples not wash their hands? They're not doing what we prescribed in the Old Testament. They're breaking laws. And when they eat with dirty hands, it makes you dirty. How many of you are afraid of germs? Raise your hand. Let me tell you something. Just so you know, you are a germ. There's bad germs, there's good germs. There's bad bacteria, there's good bacteria. Right? How many of you have bacteria inside your intestinal tract? What kind of bacteria is that? Good kind. Do you ever look inside of a intestinal tract and what travels through that intestinal tract? You're telling me that stuff is the good kind? It's called flora. Okay. This is why I read about uh, acidophilus. You know what acidophilus is? It's a bacteria. You take acidophilus and it disperses in your intestinal tract this good bacteria. And it creates flora, flora inside your intestinal tract. And your intestinal tract, if it's healthy, the flora begins to grow like little fingers. Check it out. Google it. And those fingers grow in the intestinal tract and they go like this. They start to wave when they're healthy. The acidophilus builds that bacteria. You eat bacteria. And all of a sudden, these fingers start to grow. And they start to do this all of, on the inside track of your digestion. It's just going like this. And guess what it's doing? It's moving. Can I use this French word? It's moving your poop. Comprendus poop? When it's healthy, it's moving your poop. Because there's reflexes that your body has all automatically to kind of, unless you have these fingers that are healthy through the flora, if you take an antibiotic, it kills this thing called a prebiotic. A prebiotic is like found in uh, yogurt. Okay? And, it, and, and when you rebuild that, an antibiotic kills it. And when you take antibiotics, guess what? You can't poop. Let me ask you a question. How important is poop? Should we be pooping regularly? Why are, we, why are we bringing this up in church, Pastor? We're talking about poop here. Come on, really? Let's get to the spiritual song. Well, they were eating with dirty hands. And they thought that was going to kill them. Because they were earthy. You and I eat more insects when we eat a bowl of cereal. Mm, yum. We eat more insects when we eat cereal. 
there's only a prescribed amount of how much insect you can have in your cereal. FDA governs that. If you have a healthy gut, you'll have a good immune system. Did you know that? A healthy gut gives you a good immune system. A good immune system will keep you from a lot of sickness and disease. It will, just scientific, medical fuels. These guys are worried about, you got some dirt in your hands. Are we really worried about dirt on, some, on, some, on an apple tree that you pull an apple off, you haven't washed it, and you eat it? Are you really worried that that's going to kill you? You know what's going to kill you? Is sin. You know what's going to kill you? Is dirty hands when you put your hands into sin. When you do things that are sinful. That's what's going to kill you. And they're telling Jesus, your disciples, they don't even know how to wash their hands. We prescribed it in the Old Testament. Shame on you, Jesus. How come they don't eat with cleansed hands? Because that's not what kills you. What kills you is sin. When Jesus was talking to this one person here about purification, the discussions were a transition. We just talked about this a minute ago. I'll stop here in a second. Get ready, who's ever coming up. We're talking in the back about... How many times should we do communion in this church? How many times should we do communion in this church? So the guys are figuring out with a roster who's doing communion. They're going to teach on it. Who's doing the offering? They're going to teach on it. They're going to who's doing altar calls. They're going to do all this business. They're, they're in the back talking. When I saw them back, they were, all in the, they were writing stuff down. I thought, cool, they're on top of it. And they asked me, we should ask pastor whether, how many times we do communion. Let me ask you a question. How many times do we do communion? Huh? How many times do we do communion? How many times do we do? What's acceptable in the church for communion? To take the body and the bread, the, the bread and the wine, the grape juice and the bread. How many times should we do in a church? How exactly? That's what Scripture says. As many times as you get together, you can do it. We were talking about it. If we do it every week, some people. It means nothing to them. It means nothing to them. If we do it every week, some people, it means nothing. It becomes just a ritual. It's, oh, it's communion time. And we sit here and we take it and you don't even know the danger of taking it without knowing why you're taking it. The Bible says if you take it wrong, you will die early. Many sleep. If you take it wrong, you'll get sick. That's what scripture says. You'll become weak. Then you become sick. Then you die. If you don't take communion right, there's churches that will forbid you to take communion unless you've gone through their classes. And here's the thing. Why do we take communion? Some people come in here, we just take it every week. And we take it and take it and it doesn't mean anything. We come to church. You know who these people are. They come to church for the first time and you never see them again. Because that's enough for one year. That pastor talked my head off. I have enough religion for everybody now. Church is not enough one day a week. Jesus was in the temple constantly. So when people get used to something like these guys did, they devalued baptism. They devalued the communion service. When you understand what they were doing here, this discussion, how many times should we take it? As much as we choose to. Do you have to have church to take communion? Do you have to be in church to take communion? No. no. Can you take communion at home by yourself with God? Absolutely. Why is it done here in church? A body. Other believers. We're saying we agree on the same thing when we take communion. I've had people tell me, we're never coming to this church ever again because you don't take communion every week good day sir they walk away oh wait before before i say good day we're not ever coming here to hear your ugly face because you don't take communion every week spit good day sir i had people tell me they're not going to come here because we don't take communion every week That's just as bad as coming here, taking communion, and not even knowing why you take communion.
Some of you don't even know why you're here. Well, let's just check it out. We're just like entertainment. Why do you even come? Why do you even show up to church? When you walked into those front doors, did you guard your mouth? The book of Ecclesiastes says, you better guard your mouth as you enter into God's house, lest something awful happen to you. In other words, our life should be right out there, and our life should be right in here. Your life has to be, you're, you're out there more than you are in here. So when you understand that the discussions about purification were men devaluing the things of God, I was told, is that all your church does? Have Bible study? Jesus said, go and teach my people to observe what I have commanded. What do I teach from? Your favorite subjects? What do I teach? My favorite subjects? Or do I teach what Jesus taught? I will tell you, I will teach what the Bible says, not what you think I should say. I will study the Bible so we have a clear understanding. Don't devalue church. Don't devalue it. Church is important for you. Why? Because you're here for other people. It's just not for you. It's just not about you. Don't devalue communion. Because communion is symbolic, like water, of what Christ did for you. Shed his blood and broke his body on the cross. You sent him to the cross. I sent him to the cross. He died for me. My sins killed him. I look at that and he says, he died for me so I could live with God. That was a great sacrifice. It's unfathomable. It's hard to understand exactly what Christ did for you. And for you to say, eh, we don't have to go to church. You don't want to talk about what Christ did for you? We can't figure it out because it's so much grace God gave us. So much mercy. All his love was to rescue your sin sick soul. My soul. And he did it because he loved me. And he loved you. And we're here treating it like, huh? Yeah, we, we already know that. If it, doesn't excite, if it doesn't excite you, what Christ has done for you, you sit there all the time and you don't even sing. Oh, I don't like that song. We make church American bandstand. I don't like the beat. I don't like it. I'll give it a three. Oh, I like that song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what singing's about? It's singing to him. Because you understand what he did for you. It's not because you have a favorite song. It's because you have a favorite Savior. Because you love Him and what He did for you. No one could do it but Christ. Your performance is not needed. Whatever you give, and you say, God, I want to add to my salvation. So this week, I'm going to give a little bit of money to some poor people. I hope you think I'm cool. Because when I get up there, you know what God's going to do, right? When you get up there, oh God, I gave some money to some poor people. And God's going to say, oh you're so cool. You, you're awesome. Here, Jesus, get off the throne. Let's let this person sit here because they're so cool. Your perform God doesn't need your performance. Either God's going to save you or he's not. You're going to either hate sin or you're not. You're either going to make a decision for Christ or you're not. When you come to Christ, your life changes. When you come to church, nothing changes. Unless you come to Christ, your life changes. A church will never satisfy you. This pastor, this group of people are not your saviors. They're not going to make you happy. They're not going to change you. Christ in this church will. And if you have no change, you have no salvation. When you have no salvation, guess where you're going to spend eternity? No one likes to hear the word hell, bro. In this church we say it's... Uh, H-E double toothpicks. Because we don't want to offend anybody here. 
We don't offend anybody. We want to pacify. Oh, God loves you, but you don't have to repent. Oh, God loves you. Oh, you don't have to turn from your sin. Oh, God loves you. You don't have to do nothing. God loves you. You can just keep on sinning. You're not going to get that from this pastor. I tried it that way. I got the chipped tooth to prove it. I will never, ever go back to that life. I'm going to be surrendered to him. That's the best life. Who's coming up? Test. God is good. That was an awesome. Shall we stand for just a minute? That message touched me personally. I hope you were fed and touched as well. But this evening, this today, as we're here, with every head bowed, God was speaking to some of us here this morning. To some of those out there on Facebook or YouTube, you heard this message. You understood that we all have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Pastor talked about the snake in the time of Moses. Some of you may have been bitten by that snake this week or just recently. That snake of oppression, of depression, of loneliness. Maybe it's a dark storm in your life, something you're going through that's very difficult. Some of it may be drugs or alcohol, maybe even suicide, maybe sickness. But there's issues in your life that you're dealing and you're not even sharing it with anyone. For those on Facebook, those on YouTube, we want to pray with you. If you fall in any one of these categories and have been bitten by that snake, God loves you. He wants to be your friend, your savior. If you're on Facebook, you can wave at us and acknowledge that this message has touched you and that you need God, God in your life. We all need God. Without him, we are nothing. Merely dust to dust and ashes to ashes. For you and I will die. We will die because of sin. Sin that entered into this earth. And the wages of sin is death. But God gives us eternal life. But we have to acknowledge that he is our God. Savior. Redeemer. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know your issues. I don't know you personally. I surely don't know those you out there on Facebook and YouTube. But today, God loves you and cares for you. We're going to say a sinner's prayer, but before we do this, some of you may say with every head bowed, I've been going through some of those issues you were talking about. I've gone through dr drugs, alcohol, suicide, depression, oppression, loneliness, fears, anxiety, I've dealt with them all. And I, by the raising of your hand at the count of three, I want you to say, pray for me. If you're an individual out there who says, I need prayer, I want you to raise your hand at the count of three. And at the count of three, those on Facebook can wave at us and say, pray for me. We will acknowledge your prayers. And so one, because God touched you this morning. This sermon was food for your spiritual life. You're here today for a purpose and a reason. God loves you. Two, because he's here to encourage you, to lift you up, to bring you out of darkness. And this morning, today, at the count of three, if that was you, raise your hand. It's three. You're, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Those out on Facebook can wave at us and say, hey, pray for me too. Not to embarrass anybody, I'm not going to call you forward, but I see those hands and I see we see them on Facebook. Let us pray together first the prayer of salvation and then we'll pray for you as well, each and everyone out there. For those who have know they're sinners and fallen short of the grace of God, I urge you to pray this. But you must believe in your heart that God 
sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins and that Jesus Christ died and resurrected that we may have eternal life. So examine your own lives this morning as we say this prayer. Dear Jesus, help me this today. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. Forgive me. And I believe that you died on the cross that I may have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for dying for my sins. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we continue with that same prayer for all those hands that were raised. Those who are going through dark storms in their lives. Those who are having difficult times financially, physically, spiritually. God, for those who are waved out on, on social media, Lord, touch them. Meet their needs, Lord. Bless them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. For those who are seeking salvation, save their souls, Lord. Cleanse them. Help them. Be there with them each and every day. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. God is good. And again, it's good to see so many faces here. Those four months were long and long. about but God blesses the cheerful giver he blesses each and every one of us so there's uh, different ways that we can give and that's we can send a, a love offering or a text by texting on the uh, scriptures here says 855-920-0405 we can text that we can go to the give plus app or we can actually mail an offering and it comes directly to the church and this offerings that you guys give helps this community it doesn't just stay in this church it goes throughout this community to help others it does pay the lights the water the gas but many a times we help other families other individuals and this time of this crazy virus it's it's been an awesome opportunity to send out food boxes different helps that we could have been able to give so your offerings do help others and we want to thank you for being part of this church and part of this ministry with your offerings and your tithes. So at this time, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to be dismissed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I'm going to dismiss you that you go home in your, in your weary weeks, that you have a good week and a prosperous week. Amen, and God bless you all. See you next week. See you Wednesday night. <laughs>